Good morning. I'm Larry Stutzrain, Director of Research here at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. In this era of great power competition, nuclear deterrence is still the bedrock of our ability to deter an adversary's actions, especially those of nuclear peer competitors. Russia is developing innovative nuclear weapons delivery methods, and China now fully supports a full nuclear triad. Now more than ever, the issue of maintaining, upgrading our own triad should be at the forefront of our minds. I'm sure you are all familiar, but here on our Nuclear Deterrence Forum, we normally like to focus on the ground and air-breathing legs of the nuclear triad. The Air Force owns and maintains the Minuteman III ICBM program, as well as our strategic bomber force. But today, we're extremely fortunate to have Rear Admiral Scott Papano with us to discuss the Navy sea leg of the triad and its importance moving into the future. Admiral Papano is the Program Executive Officer for Strategic Submarines in the United States Navy. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and holds a Master of Science in Nuclear Engineering from MIT. Prior to his current role, he served as the commander of the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, the director of the Comprehensive Test Facility, and the Program Executive Officer of the Columbia-class submarines. Now at sea, Admiral Propano has served aboard a variety of nuclear-powered submarines, including general purpose, ballistic missile, and guided missile subs. Well, Admiral, it's a privilege to have you here today, and I thought I'd start by giving you a few minutes to tell us about what you do and what your priorities are. Thanks very much, Studs, for having me, and, and thanks for that introduction. Uh, I think it's very important, as you know, again, feeling a little bit like a fish out of water here at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies as a submariner, not a place I would normally venture into. Sure. But I think it's important, you know, as we get into the, re, you know, um, the generational recapitalization of all of our strategic forces, I think it's important to, to, to have that united message that we need all legs of the strategic triad, right? And so um, I'm responsible for the procurement and in-service sustainment of uh, the sea base leg of that deterrent. So uh, under that role, uh, just to define, what, you know, set the stage for what I do is, that's maintaining the Ohio-class in-service uh, SSBN force, making sure we get that ship to end of life as we bring on the new Columbia-class submarines um, to replace the, the, the Ohio's that are aging out right now and really for me to drive that transition from Ohio to Columbia smoothly to make sure an uninterrupted sea-based strategic deterrent um, is maintained throughout that to meet stratcom requirements for the sea-based force. Uh, that's a challenge right now with you know the industrial base where it is. So under my uh, purview also is a submarine industrial base element, right, to kind of connect those two things to provide the feedstock for the the, um, the both the in-service and the new construction submarines to help support the the defense industrial base. So I dabble in that as well, and then. We, the other way I want people to think about on the sea base side is it's not just the submarine that that I manage. Um, it's also you know very closely requires working with uh, strategic programs. Admiral Wolf, who provides the strategic weapon system and the missile, is part of that. So the modernization of the D5LE to the D5LE2 is part of that modernization package. And frankly, the strategic shore infrastructure that has been aging over years uh, that we built with the Ohio class at Kings Bay and Bangor not only you know, bringing on the things that we need to do for the Columbia capabilities, but recapitalizing those existing structures and capability as part of the West weapon systems where I have a two crew concept, you know, I need a, 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 a viable training facility to train a, a, a crew ashore while the other crews at sea with the ship, bring it in and have that crew ready to go to sea immediately as we do and quickly turn them out, maintenance in our Trident Reefer facilities to make sure we have the maximum operational availability of those submarines to meet the requirements of Stratcom. So that's kind of the big picture right now. So I'll, well, I'm certainly happy to dive in any specific you questions you have. Well, it's a big picture, big span of responsibility. We will get into industrial base a little bit and some questions here. But uh, I thought uh, I'd start at the basics and ask you, you know, explain the role and importance of the sea leg of the triad uh, in terms of supporting our nuclear deterrence. Okay, great question. Obviously, um, yeah. As I look across the triad in general, all legs have their strengths, right? Whether you know it's the speed of the ICBMs, it's the overt signaling of the bombers. You know what I think the sea base leg brings to the table is obviously our stealth and survivability uh, to survive a first strike. You know. Um, 
without being detected and, and, and know where we are uh, to hold us, you know, uh, deter our, our peer competitor from doing that. It also carries about 70% of the nuclear uh, deterrent right now uh, force. And so I'd say it's the largest and most survivable leg again, but we need all the different legs of the triad to, to, to perform the different parts of the mission. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, it's interesting. I'm a cold warrior uh, where I started. And uh, the original, you know, the SLBM force was sized for two fleets, one in the Atlantic, one in the Pacific. But it was about the Soviet Union at that time. And we maintained that posture against uh, Russia later. And then now we're looking, we see China. Uh, you know, the images are out there. Uh, They've committed to uh, a huge rebuilding of ICBMs. Of course, I mentioned earlier its own triad. I'm curious whether you see a change in weighting of where we station our, our submarines or perhaps the numbers are going to change. So uh, um, right now, as you suggest, there's been a, on the Naval side, especially, there's been a flow of forces from the Atlantic to the Pacific based on the, the change in the, in the threats that we're seeing in the world today. Uh, without getting in, into any classified details, obviously our SSBN force uh, is capable of supporting multiple packages from either coast, right? So uh, it is not, there is flexibility in that, in our ability on, on targeting um, to cover both of the, our, whatever threats are out there right now. I am not a targeteer and I, and I won't get into any specific targeting things, but there's obviously flexibility there on where I can target with whether what ocean they're in um, is less dependent than it used to be in the yeah, past. Very good. Yeah, I, well, let's talk about Columbia class. You uh, oversaw that acquisition cycle. And uh, what can you tell us about how many and timeline for delivery? Yeah, I still do oversee it as part of the portfolio. And so right now, you know, based on the most recent nuclear posture review studs is uh, that states that we want at least 12 uh, Columbia class submarines to replace the 14 Ohio's that we currently have right now. Uh, right now, the original plan went to go from 14 to 12 from on Columbia to Ohio, or correction, Ohio to Columbia, was I took out, uh, there's no need to refuel the Columbia base on its design, so I could get the same operational avail availability by saving a year in my midlife depot period mm. to buy back some of that. Now, we're continuing to analyze that right now going forward. Um, certainly, it reduces risk uh, if we have a 13th or a 14th SSBN, Columbia, SS Columbia class SB SSBN. Um, and so we'll continue to evaluate that. That's not a decision we need to make right now. Um, that's something we need by the end of the decade, we need to make that decision on. But the current class is planned for 12 Columbia class SSBNs. So, so uh, beyond the numbers, uh, can, what can you tell us about uh, how the Columbia class improves over Ohio class. Well, frankly, it's the biggest and it's the quietest and most capable you know, nuclear submarine our nation will have ever produced. It's really a, a fantastic machine. Uh, again, I can't talk too many details about that, yeah. but it is the quietest, it, it is the biggest. Uh, it brings the same stealth and survivability at a more advanced level that, uh, that the Ohio brings. And it also, you know, we've also continued, like Ohio, to design sustainability into that class, which I think is very important to make sure we get that ship that a life and they have the sustainability of it and can turn that ship around quickly and let the crew obviously stay in that ship throughout its life. Uh, I saw uh, some remarks you gave at the uh, Naval Submarine League's uh, get together and you were concerned seriously about supply uh, chains. And uh, I'm just curious, do you still have those same concerns? If, has that changed at all? No, I, absolutely. That remains, you know, you know, frankly, on the new construction side of the house, as we build submarines and ships and everything else um, and sustain them, uh, that remains the biggest risk right now, I would say, across a couple of different fronts. And uh, principally, I'd say my biggest concern is about workforce, the getting the right workforce to go do that in the skilled trades, both in our nuclear shipyards and throughout the vendor base that provides material that feeds those shipyards. Uh, it's been it's a little bit different world than it used to be. Right. And yeah. we've uh, since the uh, heyday of shipbuilding in the 1980s. Uh, uh, under the Reagan buildup years, you know, we've, uh, we were about 33% of uh, the industry was, you know, uh, of jobs in the United States were in manufacturing. And we're somewhere down around 11% as we've shifted yep. from a manufacturing-based wow. economy to a service-based economy. Uh, that tied with a, a real push to send kids to college where you had to be successful. That's not true. We need skilled mm -hmm. trades 
uh, feeding our industrial base right now. And so that's a very big push for us right now. There's a couple of initiatives that we're working on in coordination with OSD to, to, for workforce development uh, initiatives and recruiting and retaining initiatives for throughout the industrial base to go help drive those things across the nation. Because I think, frankly, not only when we talk about the triad for, you know, an integrated deterrence, you know, our industrial base is actually part of that in integrated deterrence picture, right? That Great ought to, point. it ought to drive, um, you know, our ability to deter our peer adversaries, right? If we don't start redeveloping that industrial base, I think that we're, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a detrimental in the long run. Oh, fantastic points. Well, let's drill down on that a little bit uh, in terms of industrial base. Uh, the ability of the shipyards today, you, talk, you referred to, uh, you know, that, that change, but uh, is that affecting uh, staying on schedule? What happens downstream? So right now, it's, um, it, it is a challenge getting the workforce right now, uh, as well as getting the supply base to get the amount of materials that we need are pushing, uh, because we've seen a significant ramp up in shipbuilding, obviously. And so there's, um, you know, you know, we were just at the, our nuclear shipbuilders at Electric Boat in uh, Groton and Kwanzaa Point and Newport News in the Hampton Roads area. Um, we've gone from one per year Virginia construction to two per year Virginia construction, adding a large center section called uh, uh, vertical payload module to that Virginia, and now adding Columbia. So by FY25, 26 timeframe, we'll have, it's about a five-fold increase in shipbuilding yeah. from the big, you know, from about five years ago, which is a significant ramp up right now. And so the Columbia program is our priority program in the Navy. That's our number one acquisition program. And we're driving that with the shipyards right now. And so right now the plan is an 84-month contract delivery schedule on that submarine. Uh, we have worked with the shipbuilder to, to build a 78-month early delivery schedule. Uh, we are behind that 78-month schedule right now and trying to drive back on a, on a restoration path. Still ahead of 84 months, um, but there's risk in that, obviously. And so uh, but my goal is obviously not to, to make sure we drive that uh, schedule back to that 78 months while not or minimizing the effect on the Virginia class construction or any carrier construction down at Newport News, right? Because frankly, we need all our forces, mm -hmm. right? So we really need to drive that workforce build up and the capability of those nuclear shipyards to build those ships. Yeah. You know, the industrial capacity, that's a national security issue. Uh, we're strategy nested. Is industry taking care of this? Does the Navy take uh, possession of What's the future outlook of the industrial base for shipping? So I think um, for many years the, the Navy did not, right? And so we, we left that to the to the prime contractors to, to you know, get what they need. Uh, what that has led us to over time is, you know, back again, back in the, the, the heavy shipbuilding days, um, the, the shipbuilders could buy very transactional things. They, they, if they wanted to go get material, or they wanted to get workers, they made the call and it came, right? Because there enough of that, the, enough of the manufacturing workforce was still there. They don't have that luxury anymore. So as we started this ramp up in the submarine shipbuilding, we, the government, the Navy, started to look what we call the integrate, integrated enterprise plan and to at least evaluate where we were to, in that ramp up and found some some trouble spots where we made some investments and very good support from congressionals on, uh, on the Hill uh, to support those efforts to, to develop the industrial base in key market sectors, uh, continuing to do that. Um, and that was part of the reason why we stood up a stubborn industrial base director under, under my hat at, at the, under the, the program oh, executive yes. office to help yeah. drive that. Uh, it, not until recently had we started looking at workforce as well. Uh, and we, it needs to be a whole of government effort, right? Is what we've come around to. So, uh, although we weren't very much involved in that in the past, we are driving that very, very hard right now to try to develop regional training pipelines uh, in our car core concentration areas. Uh, we are driving some uh, what's called accelerated training and defense manufacturing pilot down in Danville that we're going to work with OSD, IBAS, Industrial Base Analysis and, Sust and uh, st Sustainment. Um, to help drive a, a, an adult learner pipeline where, you know, we push uh, uh, students, adult students through there in a four month period for welding, machining, metrology, additive manufacturing, things that we think we're gonna need in the industrial base and then work to get those uh, folks placed in the industrial base, whether it's the nuclear shipbuilders or the tier two through five or 10 suppliers that we need to, that, to, to build out that workforce. So we're gonna continue to advance that, that regional training uh, uh, 
center concept, if you will, to try to starting in the New England area and the Hampton Roads area through the Danville and Virginia, and then look at other key concentration areas where we have a lot of uh, vendors in the industrial base. Think California, think uh, you know uh, New York, think uh, Great Lakes region, where we're going to start bringing those centers in as well. Um, to try to, to develop these pipelines, to drive uh, uh, people into training for the skilled trades and know that they can have a successful career doing that. That's an incredible insight, you know, that we typically talk about a shortage of engineers or STEM in general, mm -hmm. but the trades being so important and maintaining that that pipeline. That's, that is our key limiter right now. Not, we, and we still need engineers, Dodds. Yes, you know, yes. So I don't want to say nobody needs to go to college, right? But I, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is we need a lot more welders and machinists and pipe fitters and ship fitters and electricians. And, you know, I, I'm working to get the message out right now that, you know, hey, you can have a great career doing that in, in, in the skilled trades, frankly. Yeah, really interesting. Well, let me, let me ask you about uh, an issue with uh, respect to Pacific, and that is that the United States, the UK and Australia are teamed up to build some submarines. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that you know, in this discussion of industrial base, uh, does that chip away at it? Is there a risk to US production? Well, what I'll say is right now, I think um, my understanding, I'm not directly involved with that right now. My understanding is that's a 18 month study that's going on and should report out in March 23. So I think as we drive towards March of 23, we'll have to figure that out. Um, because we are, if you're asking my opinion, uh, if we were going to add additional con submarine construction to our industrial base, that would be detrimental to us right now without significant investment to go drive to provide additional capacity and capability yeah. to go do that. And I think that I won't speak for the UK, but I think that exists for both the US and UK where we're looking yeah. right now. Sure, sure. Uh, well, be beyond supply uh, side, supply chain issues we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, what do you assess as some of the other risks to delivering Columbia class? Probably. These are the things that keep you up maybe at night? Well, I think uh, really it is in the shipbuilding enterprise. That's the key thing. But there's a couple of things that we haven't done in, in you know, 20 plus years. You know, a full, you know, uh, missile test program, you know, a strategic weapon systems test program on a new class of ship that we're, we're driving to build a team for that right now. Um, we, we have done missile testing through strategic programs office, mm -hmm. but, you know, essentially getting the lead ship of a new class and the in-yard testing, you know, hasn't been done in 20 years, right? So oh. getting a team together to do that, getting that team ready, we're still a couple years out from that, but um, those are things that we're working on right now. And frankly, the other thing that, you know, as I talked about a little bit at the beginning, is it's the strategic shore infrastructure, right? And it's less about delivering the Columbia, but, and more about making sure I have my refit facilities and training yes. facilities ready to go to receive that chip. And in the short term, they will be, but you know, making sure I have the, the right investment in those strategic shore infrastructure to support that ship as soon as it gets there, and that capability then supports the Columbia class into the 2080s as we need it to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, of course, uh, the Ohio-class submarines are, are, are getting toward the end of their life. I think they were first uh, fielded in 1981 mm -hmm. or so. And uh, they're undergoing or they have gone through a service life extension program um, or we're thinking about that, I think. Yeah, no. Yes. Um, yeah. So if you want, I, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah. Stuff. Well, I'm just curious if in this transition, you know, from Ohio to Columbia is a risk there. No, certainly that that's really that's my job, right, is to manage that risk. It's like to get the Ohio stand of life as we bring on Columbia's in a heel to toe uh, recession. That's really the definition of my job. Um, and frankly, as you suggested, you know, with the Ohio's, that was a, a ship that we had designed for to be a 30 year ship, uh, very well designed, well built ship. So we got to the point where we were approaching 30 years and, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s did um, uh, extensive study, service life extension study on those. And we were found that we were able to extend the Ohio class from 30 to 42 years as a class. Um, so that allowed us to defer some of the recapitalization of the sea-based strategic deterrent to where we got to be Columbia, you know, where we are today with the Columbia class. Uh, but right now we have not operated submarines out to 42 years. We've come close with some fast attack submarines um, that we've had out in the 40 year range, um, but it's kind of uncharted territory. And so there are certainly risks with that. So we're watching that very closely. Um, and as we get closer to that, you know, 
part of this transition is I talked about being heel to toe on Ohio to Columbia. As one comes off, one comes on. Uh, I think that, you know, you know, to meet my requirements to STRATCOM, which is having 10 submarines ready for sea at the unclassified level, um, there are going to be times when I have 10 to make 10 in the 2030s, and I think it would be a great idea to have a couple other holes around both, uh, you know, uh, you know buy down risk for the unknown unknowns, support additional D5 LE2 missile testing. So we are looking right now, uh, in fact, planning to do individual service life extensions for up to five of the Ohio class SSBNs uh, through what we call pre-inactivation restricted availabilities, where we spend about 18 months in the depot to buy about 30 years on the back end and extend some of those uh, Ohio class submarines to have a couple around as we bring on the Columbia class to, to make sure we have those risks. And then obviously we're doing everything we can to bring Columbia class to the left, Earlier long lead time material procurement, earlier uh, you know uh, advanced construction, those kind of things to try to continue to bring the class back to the left, to min minimize any gaps, eliminate any gaps, and get as much overlap as we can. Well, I would say forty-two years is a youngster compared to some of the Air Force bombers. <laughs> that That's we true. Have. Yeah. Well, how about how about service life extension is an interesting discussion mm -hmm. too. As you know, the uh, that was a debate on the Minuteman three. You mm -hmm. know, it, does it steal money from the Minuteman three replacement GBSD, uh, or uh, you know, where do we put the limited resources uh, when taking those costs? You know, that kind of costing into consideration. Uh, what do you think about further slepping of Ohio class? I think you know, as the as the guy driving the sea base for TD term platform angle of this, I think it's uh, I think it's the right thing to do, right? Yeah. And frankly, I, I think you you know you probably heard Admiral Richard say this in the past, but uh, we have to stop talking about if this is the most important thing that we're doing in strategic deterrence, and that underpins you know our national defense right across all legs. I think we have to stop talking about what we can do with what we have and what we need you know to do what we need to do. Frankly, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that. Again, it's easy for me to say that because, you know, uh, but I think that there needs to be that discussion and, and drive for those kind of things to make sure I have that availability, uh, the right, uh, you know, strategic deterrence for the nation. Yeah. And, and, and slepping is going to help with that transition, reduce the, uh, that risk you have between the Absolutely. two classes. Absolutely. Uh, other risks to that transition? Oh, I, I'm sure there's plenty out there that, you know, but uh, that's probably about all right now. I think, you know, as I say, look again, we talked, the Ohio's getting into life. We talked about Columbia's coming left. We talked about strategic shore infrastructure. We talked about industrial base. That's pretty much the things that keep me up right now. So yeah. I think we're good. And you talked very well about how to mitigate uh, some of those risks. Appreciate that. Um, well, it's the Columbia class, your number one priority in the Navy, and uh, it's in your portfolio. Um, uh, what do you think about uh, resource commitments to this? What's the temperature of Congress in terms of? I will tell you, we've been uh, very. Uh, Congress has been very supportive of the class, right? I think that you know my read on you know when we go to the Hill and it, all the readback I got is um, they understand the importance of of, of the sea base like the deterrent and all legs of the of the of the triad. Uh, they have been very supportive of, of uh, the Columbia construction, and and in fact, even things were initiatives we did to try to bite on risk and bring Columbia construction to the left, which caused you know rephasing of money earlier than it might otherwise be required. Uh, they have been supportive of that as well to try to drive that earlier uh, purchase of long lead time material, the earlier advanced construction, to continue to do everything we can to bring Columbia class. Uh, deliveries to the left. I've yeah. been very supportive of that. Yeah. You know, I, I, earlier I mentioned uh, we did this uh, uh, survey, public uh, knowledge of uh, do you support the triad? And, you know, you tell them about what's going on and it's, it's amazing how much support there is for it. Where might there be some budget tightness in this program, the Columbia program? Uh, as far as uh, where the, the budget risks are there yeah, or no? Yeah. Um, again, I think that, you know, again, we it's my job to make sure I'm defending exactly and my program is defending exactly why we're doing and, and not, you know, be running amok, obviously, with, you know, we are challenged on all our requests for funds right now, but we are essentially... Um, 
in our buy for now. So we are building the first ship about 25% complete. We have advanced construction on the second ship. Um, and so a lot of the earlier battles were about when to go initialize those. And the only other thing we have outstanding right now is how I have 10 ships left to buy. Um, it is a more advantage, advantageous to us and the industrial base to pull those into, uh, you know, group those in as big a contracts as we can. So our plan is going to be to get five of uh, the next five ships in the next contract, which will, you know, the plan would be to start the, the third ship in the class in FY26. So we're starting to work that right now as far as, you know, the budgeting associated with that. Um, I'd love to do all 10, but, you know, yeah. that's just kind of a bridge too far sure. right now. But we'll look at material buys for those because the other thing I want to do is, you know, as far as risks in the industrial base, as much as I can level load them and get a demand signal to the industrial base, you know, to get at least five ship sets, perhaps up to 10 ships of some material, getting order in the industrial base to try to have – make sure that demand signals out there. Uh, that's something we're looking at right now as well, too, as we move forward here to try to buy down any industrial base risk there. Yeah, well, I, re I really appreciate it. And I know our uh, Dean, uh, Lieutenant General Dave Deptula, appreciates you coming on, on, on this uh, program. Uh, it's important, as we discussed earlier, that uh, we talk about the triad in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to having you back sometime. We're going to transition to Q&A right now from the audience. And uh, what I'd ask is uh, when I call on you uh, for questions, please uh, unmute your mic and identify who you're with. And, uh, and we'll start with a question from... Michael Mattis. Oh, no, I'm sorry. St. Jin Lee, go ahead and ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I have a, a question about North Korea. Um, North Korea is a report to develop new submarine enough to launch SLBM. Uh, can you share any update of indication on this? And then second question is that, is the U.S. ready to deploy U.S. nuclear submarine nearby Korean Peninsula if North Korea will conduct nuclear test? Last question: What do you think about what do you think about the argument that South Korea need to develop nuclear submarine to respond to North Korean nuclear test? Okay, great question. I put my answer is probably not going to fully satisfy you. So, the bottom line is, you know, it's uh, because we're in an unclassed environment. I can't talk about exactly where we deploy our submarines to, and uh, about our, you know, response to other countries out there. So that, and that's frankly outside my wheelhouse. My job is to build, sustain, you know, uh, our uh, strategic submarine force. So I really can't answer those questions. And, uh, and as far as the South Korea side goes, I think that's a question for uh, South Korean government about whether they need nuclear or uh, conventional submarines. So, but thanks for the question. Probably not a great answer for you, but that's about all I can do on this net. I thought that was a great answer for this. Net. <laughs> we have a question from Kevin Stubbs, Admiral. Can you discuss how hypersonics might affect the triad as you look forward? Again, a little outside my wheelhouse, but uh, um, obviously there are hypersonics being developed uh, on the Navy side and kind of jointly with um, uh, through the strategic programs under Admiral Wolf. Um, you know, I, I I don't know the answer about whether that, you know, conventional or nuclear. Again, that's outside my wheelhouse. Uh, but my understanding of the plan is that we would not deploy uh, the hypersonics on our strategic submarines. Uh, there would be other platforms that we would be planning to deploy those weapons from rather than our, our strategic forces. Can you talk to another question from the audience here? Talk to uh, potential replacement of the D5 and future of the Columbia class? Uh, absolutely, I can do that a little bit. Again, the missile development from D5 to D5 LE2 is uh, under Admiral Wolf at Strategic Programs, right? Uh, he owns the strategic weapon system, which I host on the submarine. So we work very closely, uh, and not only with Admiral Wolf, but also with uh, our UK counterparts in a uh, on the Dreadnought program, which is their counterpart to the Columbia class. Um, so moving forward, you know, in parallel with Columbia, the, the, the Columbia class development is a transition from D5 to D5 LE2. That transition will take place, um, you know, by Columbia Hull 9 and beyond, we'll have all D5 LE2 missiles on it. So on the earlier Hull classes, we'll have to uh, find opportunities working closely with Admiral Wolf and his team to make sure we have uh, uh, 
uh, SSBNs available for test flights on those missiles, as we have to test them on both Ohio and Columbia class submarines because we're in the transition there. But beyond the, uh, Columbia Hall 9, those will all be D5 LE2 missiles and going forward from there. Very good. Admiral, I've got a really interesting question coming in from a young kid, uh, Michael. And he says uh, he wants to be a naval aviator, but he does want to know how they name the ships. Do they name submarines? So how they name them? Yes. Okay. So Michael, great question, right? But uh, the bottom line is that it's a Secretary of the Navy decision, right? So we have some naval instructions on how we name the ships. Um, you know, if, if I could help talk you into submarining instead of aviation, let me know. I'll get, I'll get uh, my number out to you after this. But uh, yeah, the naming conventions typically, the naming is completely by the Secretary of the Navy. That's his discretion on how he does that. Um, for right now, if you look at our uh, the, the ships in our class, right, our strategic submarines are typically named after states. Um, we've started taking up state names on the Virginia class submarines. We've stopped that. They're going back to World War II tradition of naming after fishes. Have you seen the last couple of Virginia class submarines? that have been named, um, but we will maintain the state names. The first set of class is District of Columbia, which is, I would say, a state or a district at this point. And so everything else will be uh, second ship of the class is the Wisconsin, and then uh, the follow-on ships have not been named yet. Okay, Michael, we'll be sending, uh, the Admiral will be sending a recruiter to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, question here uh, about additive manufacturing in okay. the industrial base. Uh, in shipbuilding. Uh, is that something that's a priority? Are we moving toward that? That is a fantastic question, right? Because I, I will tell you, uh, so that's, you know, as we talk about risking the industrial base, I talk about constrained market sectors. Some of our most constrained sectors are in castings and in forgings, right? Where I pour molten metal into sand and then machine it, right? So for big equipment. Uh, we have struggled there in, in, in that market sector. And uh, added manufacturing, I think, is a key uh, to breaking through that and, and going forward mm -hmm. here right now. Uh, and there's been some inertia, resistance to that, doing that in the Navy. Uh, my team is working to drive through that. We have some very strong initiatives in that area right now. I mentioned Danville a little bit earlier. In addition to the uh, additive training and defense manufacturing, we are standing up an additive manufacturing center of excellence in that area right now, where I, we're going to drive to buy a couple. We're working with a consortium of folks right now to bring in and, and across industry, across academia, across national labs uh, and, um, you know, our, our industrial-based partners uh, to bring in, hey, what machines could we do this on for a directed energy deposit or different types of methods for added manufacturing? Uh, and we're going to qualify processes down there. We're going to yeah. drive through that, and then we're going to allow that, rather than trying to qualify individual capabilities, we're going to qualify machines and processes so that we can farm out that capability of the industrial base and lower the barriers of entry to making parts for across all submarine ship aircraft classes right now. Frankly, the airline aircraft industry is ahead of us in this. They're using a lot of titanium out of manufactured parts right now. We have some different materials that we have to drive into, like high yield, high yield steels, nickel copper, that we're working on right now in the Navy, and we are going to drive this forward mm -hmm. um, and, and push it. We have to. I think it's an imperative to go do that. And by doing that, then if I lower those barriers of entry where you can buy a CNC machine uh, and, and qualify in a process, now you can you know, have, we can push towards a more distributed industrial operations, if you will, right? Where, hey, a smaller, you know, startup company could have a couple of machines and just be making parts for, for the Navy, for the Air Force, for the Army. I don't care who it is, but we'll make it for the Navy first. We'll put those at the top of the list. That's uh, fantastic. We, we've done some uh, additive manufacturing uh, papers and studies here at Mitchell. And uh, what, what a technology, what a growth in that. It's great to hear. Hey, we got a question here uh, that uh, asks about GAO, saying that there's some gr uh, growth, uh, cost growth for the Columbia class. And he's just asking, uh, what are some of the factors in that cost growth? So frankly, right now, they're, um, you know, we are well within our o OSD cost caps right now. Um, so well, it's not actually a co cost cap. It's actually a cost goal for us right now. And we've actually, in the latest round that, you know, it's lagging the, the GA reports a little bit right now, but we've actually seen some reductions in cost in the Columbia class based on kind of how we're, how we're uh, uh, 
prioritize the work right now. Now, there's obviously risk, right? If we're talking about uh, the, the current environment that we're in right now, if we're seeing, you know, inflation of prices of commodities and, you know, trying to recruit a workforce that we might have to pay more, you know, there's poss- those are risks for growth going forward here. So I won't, uh, I, you know, I think everybody understands, you know, coming out of the pandemic and what, the, you know, that kind of had some issues, you know, and reprioritize what people were doing and where we are going forward right now. We certainly, you know, if you go to the grocery store and food costs more, you could probably expect that nickel and copper costs more as well, too. So things will continue yeah. to evaluate, but there is risk there, certainly. Yeah. Well, Dan Rice uh, has a question here, um, wants to ask a more broad question about nuclear deterrence. And he, he mentions that you mentioned that, uh, you know, numbers of subs may be going down. But we also look at an aging uh, bomber force uh Potential delays to Minuteman three, maybe not. Uh, what is your out there on the public circuit? What are you telling the nation about uh, the importance of maintaining adequate capacity in addition to modernization? Are we talking? I, I guess so. If you're talking just about the sea based deterrent, okay, I, that's easier for me to talk about. As far as I generally don't talk about the broader, you know, I don't have the details on on the missile or bomber, you know, modernizations yes, or, or okay. delays or everything. Like, um, so my general message has been obviously, hey, we need to we need all legs of the deterrent, all legs of the triad here to to, to accomplish the mission for the reasons we talked about at the very front. Every piece of that triad has a particular mission that is important for it to do. Um, and we, generally speaking, will talk, um, you know, we try to make sure we educate uh, inside the belt. We hear a lot of times we have new staffers coming on. We have new uh, folks coming into key leadership positions in the, on the Navy staff. Uh, we will run a seminar for those folks that talks really about all the levels of the tri- all legs of the triad. Yeah. We'll focus primarily on the sea base leg because that's our job. Uh, but we want everybody to understand what those other factors are, what the other legs of the triad do to support overall integrated strategic deterrence, right? So... Uh, education is usually best here and uh, talking in these kind of forums about uh, to cross pollinate where what what sea base leg brings, you know, and having the, the bomber and, and, and ICBM folks talk, you know, at our forums, you know, to go look at those, you know, how we talk about their importance, you know, and how we fit the whole picture together. Yeah, very good. A question here about NC3, the command and control. Uh, is it as important to the uh, to the submarine fleet? as it is to the rest of the triad. Yes, it is. It's outside my, again, outside yes. my wheelhouse, but sure. absolutely, modernization of the NC3 is critical for us, right? Because we, none of us can, you know, deploy nuclear weapons without effective NC3. That's the backbone of all of this. Yeah, there's a number of uh, questions here. I'll just summarize uh, okay. that talk about your thoughts about how, whether the services can, um, collaborate to communicate to the nation more effectively the need for a modern uh, and adequate uh, triad. I think absolutely. And I think we've started to come together in a couple of of different circuits, um, you know, where the you know, where it has pr- traditionally been either uh, submarine only or, um, you know, you know, ICBM bomber only, those kind of things. Um, I've seen a lot more, uh, you know, common events right now where we were bringing all legs of the triad together kind of when we to, to talk about specific things and I've sat on on panels recently with uh, you know Air Force generals you know responsible for the for that for those legs and you know having a joint panel on those kind of things I think is absolutely necessary and it's a I think it's a uh, Obviously, getting the message out to the public is also imperative, right? I think that there's a out of sense, you know, for a long, long time, I think it has not been on the forefront of the public's mind. But now that we have a nuclear power, you know, you know, in a conventional, you know, war with a neighbor, I think that has brought that to the forefront again. And so reminding the American public of how important it is to have strategic nuclear deterrence um, is, is important. And I think the easiest way to sell that message is to ask ourselves whether we're deterred or not by yeah. by by uh, Russia's nuclear arsenal right now. Would we be doing more in Ukraine if Russia was not a nuclear power? I'm not a policy guy, but I think I would answer. I think the answer is yes. Yeah. So it's an opportunity to talk about nuclear deterrence and what it does to for, uh, as a stabilizing force. This is an interesting question. A little bit of a stretcher. Would you say? Uh, 
Columbia class development is well integrated with the larger naval force to ensure better integration and interoperability once the first sub fields. How about with the joint force? Uh, it's, it's kind of a loaded question, right? Because I am an independent operator, right? As an SSBN. Uh, so it is designed to integrate. So where I plug into the joint forces through NC3, right? That's it. Um, in general, we are, our submarines are divided designed to integrate with the joint force, but mostly on the fastest hack side of the house where I can work across the, uh, you know, um, the joint force to communicate and, you know, deploy, uh, you know, weapons and those kind of things. The SSBN's job is to operate independently, uh, unknown to the joint force, essentially, right? Yes. Undetected by the joint force. Right. Um, so we don't even allow ourselves to be detected by our own forces. Mm. That's very good. Uh, good question here. Given the massive amounts of software required to maintain all the systems aboard a sub and the rapid innovations in AI, uh, cyber threats, autonomous undersea vehicles, and so forth, is there a plan to keep up with advanced threats and accelerate innovation cycles to keep Columbia ahead of the curve? The, answer, the short answer is yes, right? And so the way we're doing that is, you know, back when we built the Ohio, we built mil spec essentially. Combat systems that you know were lasted for you know 10, 20 years and then got replaced with a new mil spec system. What we have done is you know what we did on the fast tack submarine side in our non-propulsion electronic systems. Think about all the things that have software, combat systems, sensors, weapons, those kind of things. Where you think about software driven, where you're analyzing data, it can bring AI ML to bear. Um, we are doing all that right now to try to, to keep up with the, the pace of, of industry, essentially, right, and, and processing power that we can be brought to bear. So we started that in our fast tag submarines, where we we modernize hardware and software on, on, on different cycles, and we're continuing to modify that to drive to a virtual environment on the fast attacks. And I'm talking about those because what we are doing is the SSBNs will follow that. We use to have separate mil spec systems for the SSBNs. So we're driving the innovation into the fast stack submarines, be able to do that to get to the point where we're in a, in a, uh, a virtual environment where it's just, you know, it's hardware agnostic, if you will, and then I can upgrade software on a faster base and upgrade hardware when I need to, but um, separate from software. And so we're driving to that in the FY24, FY25 timeframe for kind of initial fielding of that virtual environment. There's some of that already going on in pockets. Um, and then whatever we do in the fast attacks, we will then leap from, bring that right into the SSBNs. Yeah. So there's commonality between all classes. That's better for crew training. It's, um, you know, so I can bring a fast attack sale to an SSBN, you know, without any, you know, um, you know, spin up time essentially to go get to that new level, and then I can modernize the same ships with the same software, you know, uh, much closer together. And, and the less diversity I have of those systems, the better off I am sustaining them. Uh, a question about uh, from industry uh, anonymous, but uh, can you name your top several wish lists? in terms of, I think the question means what you'd like to industry to be doing for you better? Uh, yeah, I think uh, if, if that's the question, I think the answer is I, I need your help, right? I need, you know, first of all, you know, for what you're doing right now, if you know, in, in the industry, I need a, a, the, the best thing is first time quality, you know, meet schedule, meet cost, right? To develop your own individual processes to go do that first time quality on schedule at cost, right? That's the best thing you do. Um, where we're looking to expand, right? I'm, I'm looking for your help and where those things are. My job is to give a uh, steady demand signal to the industrial base. And so they have, they can make investments based on that. I'm trying to do that by saying, hey, the next contract for Columbia will be five ships, you know, and, and then we're going to look to buy 10 ship sets and try to provide that stability and investment opportunity. Um, but the other thing is, hey, work, workforce, 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 work with your local. I think what broke down a lot with, uh, it, you know, developing the workforce that you need, right? It's, it, I will help where I can, but where industry can help themselves is rebuild some of the connective tissue that maybe broke down in the 90s and 2000s as we as we dropped the manufacturing base with the continuing technique. Um, um, 
the CTE schools, you know, the kind of the, the high school level mm -hmm. trade pipelines, if you will, rebuild those ties. We've done some of that in a Philadelphia pipeline project. And I think it's an opportunity to kind of work with local communities, local schools, local government officials to go work to get those pipelines. The more of the independent pipeline development and workforce development that we do to try to rebuild the nation of manufacturing, I think is, is the best that we can do. Individual companies, quality, you know, cost schedule, keep driving those things, let me know how I can help. But nationally, we need to kind of drive that workforce back, the skilled trades, the engineers, you know, everything that we need to rebuild the manufacturing of the nation. Yeah, uh, there's part two of this question has to do with communicating. Uh, as a PEO, uh, do you think communications between industry and your needs is adequate? I think it can always be better, right? And so, I think that there has been traditionally, I think there's been some communications uh, gaps, um, as I talked about, between the prime contractor and sub vendors, right, where that used to be very much a transactionally driven process. Uh, I think that there needs to be better communication there. And I think the prime contractors are working towards doing that right now. Uh, forums like these, forums like Naval Sub League and DIA events, is a chance for me to communicate. And so, and now we are starting to do much more of that across all spectrum, right? And my, the best way that I could communicate is have uh, a no kidding demand signal, hey, two ships under contract that now, five ships coming under contract, then you know we're buying five ships of some material. The more we can do that in how that's tied to Virginia class shipbuilding or nuclear uh, aircraft carrier shipbuilding so that we have that demand that we know is going to the industrial base. To, that's the best way I think I could communicate, but because talk is cheap, right? I can go to those forums and say, I'm gonna buy 12 submarines. When I have those submarines under contract is when the industry believes me, frankly, right? Yeah, so. right, right. Uh, let me pull you back to okay. uh, Ohio class subs. I love Ohio class you subs. Bet. I'm sure you do. Um, what, what are some issues of maintenance and sustainment of those subs that give you concerns about keeping them in the water longer? This is tied to another question, which is just generally about uh, uh, any uh, concerns about maintenance and sustainment of that class? So, yeah, it's a great question, right? And so you, you never know until it gets you, right? So I think, you know, we, uh, again, we've done a very detailed study, you know, uh, to get those to 42 years, the Ohio class. Um, but now that we're approaching that right now, it's in the eaches of those things you have to go look at. And every ship is a little bit different. Um, so I will tell you the first risk mitigator that helps me think about these things is uh, we converted the first four ships in that class to guided missile submarines, SSGNs. Um, and so they are an Ohio class hull frame. And we, have, and we have run those ships very, very hard. Much harder operating profile, much harder operating environment than the SSBN platform, mm -hmm. by where they go, what they do. Um, and so that's kind of a, the, the term I've used is a canary in the coal mine for us, for things to look for. So we're calling data back, you know, we're looking at the SSGNs right now and learning from them to get the Ohio State in the class, right? And a lot of times it's kind of, you know, I, I don't, worry about the hull. We'll figure out the hull, right? It's just metal. I can weld metal. Mm. It's in the eaches, right? You know, what systems have degraded over time, whether it's a, you know, think about, you know, a plumbing system, that C connected system, and what's the erosion, corrosion on that, and how much of that piping system are we cutting out as we do these uh, material condition assessments on these ships to get them to the end of life. Um, but we have a good picture, site picture on the SSGNs. We'll probably, when we start to bring in SSGNs offline, which will be ahead of SSBNs, we'll start doing some destructive analysis of those ships to make sure we fully inform our ability to sustain the Ohio's to the end of life. That's the bottom line. Very good. Well, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this Nuclear Deterrence Forum. Uh, and I want to thank you, Admiral. It was a great discussion. And I hope we get you back. Uh, I'm happy to do it. Thanks soon. for having me. Really great and, time. Uh, I want to say thanks to our guests today and from all of us at Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Have a great aerospace power kind of day.